What up everybody? Today we have a video that should have been out like a week ago, but I kind of slacked off and it didn't release, so here it is now. My apologies. Today we're covering the big bad Buddhists of ancient Japan, the Sohei. These guys are pretty rad, so I really can't wait to talk about them. Alright, without further ado, because I suck at writing intros, let's run it. These guys, while they are extremely cool, kind of bring a, a somewhat hilarious contrast to Buddhism. After you learn about them, you're going to think of the Buddhists nowadays and their peaceful ways, you know, the bald guys in the orange robes, hanging out in the mountaintop monasteries and such. However, they most certainly did not start out like this. Much like, say, the Christians of the world, they underwent quite the evolution to get to their current peaceful relatively speaking selves. While we don't know exactly when they first began to appear, we do know that the first Sohei sects began to establish temples in the 700s or so. Now that's not to say that Sohei existed, it was just the Tendai Buddhist sect. Around this time, the first major three temples formed, and they were called Kofukiji, Enryakuji, and the Midera. Now a really cool little fact about these temples is that they're still standing and you can visit and explore the grounds in person which in my opinion is pretty wicked. Now back on track, these Sohei temples actually sort of functioned like independent clans if you want to compare them to their samurai counterparts. They all kept independent records, had their own populations, it's really kind of cool. They functioned like their own societies within Japan. Now there are records for hundreds of years of the temples fighting each other for positions in the imperial court or high ranking religious positions. This fighting was done by small groups of guards and possibly ex-soldiers seeking refuge in the monasteries. Given our knowledge of how military structures often evolve in history, we could infer that this formed the basis for the first Sohei groups. Now, I also feel I should specify because I was kind of vague. Um, this combat really started to kick off around the 800s, so it's not like the Tendai sect was formed and they immediately got to beefing with each other. Because really, you know, the whole imperial court bit kind of eludes to that fact. The imperial court didn't really come around into prominence where multiple factions would be fighting like this until early early Heian period, just for reference. The Sohei really gained momentum during the late Heian period in what's called the Genpei War, which saw a lot of political, religious, and really any kind of turmoil. It was, it was a wild time. In 970 AD, a dispute between two shrines in Kyoto, those being the Enryakuji and the Yasuka Shrine, arose, which prompted the Enryakuji to form the first professional standing army of Sohei. These Sohei were drilled intensely on combat, as well as conduct and etiquette. So, not only were they really wicked at the end of a spear, but they also were really wicked at the receiving end of a teapot. You know, they were just men of class. For the most part, these fights amongst Sohei were little more than brawls in the streets of cities, with them slowly evolving to using weapons, but not involving much manpower. This would change in about the year 981 AD, when two large temples under the Tendai sect started beefing over the use usual political positions. This led to a series of tensions rising amongst all these large temples, causing the Sohei to become more and more unified, and sort of grew to resemble the mercenary groups of Europe. The 12th century is when we see the Sohei get a little dubious. In the year 1121, the beef between the Midera and the Enryakuji became too much to overlook, and Sohei under the Enryakuji burned the Midera to the ground. Then they did it one more time in 1141 to make sure they didn't forget anything. Now, I, I'm not sure where the idea or the cause is, but I would imagine that some of the higher-ups at the Enryakuji finished the battle in 1121, and then at some point, they heard Daft Punk, they heard one more time, and they were like, you know what, let's run it one more time. Alright, now, the confusing thing about looking at the history of these Sohei is that they teamed up with each other left and right to handle a common enemy temple, making Japan a sort of Buddhist free-for-all. It was kind of a wild political landscape. Like, imagine, for example, the uh, Enryakuji and Midera. They were rivals all the time. However, there are instances of those two joining up to fight, say, the Kofukiji or something else like that. As said earlier, they really started cooking during the Genpei War, where they were immensely sought after by both the Taira and the Minamoto clans for their famed discipline and combat. This mercenary behavior actually made a massive tear in the relations between temples, which had already been pretty awful, but now they have to choose sides in the war. Naturally, a Taira-aligned temple would not get along with a Matsudaira-aligned temple, and so on. From here, I want to take a brief break from the timeline to tell you guys about the coolest Japanese myth and legend, that being the legend of Benkei, the greatest bromance story in history. Also, it's just my opinion that it's the coolest. Obviously, it's not objective. 
The tale has it that there was a Sohei traveling around Japan around the time of the Genpei War. He thought himself king of the castle, and so he went around challenging samurai to duels with the condition that if he won, he would take their katana. Generally, the samurai couldn't say much about it once they were likely dead, but regardless, his goal was to collect the Thousand Katana. He was doing exceptional in his mission until the 999th duel. He was walking on a bridge where he heard a geisha playing a beautiful flute melody. He approached the woman to speak with her when he saw that it was actually a dude, and a significant one at that. The man was Minamoto no Yoshitsune. He would be the one to end Benkei's goal of collecting a thousand katana on that bridge. First anti in history. Minamoto no Yoshitsune defeated Benkei relatively easily, and instead of ending him, decided to employ him as his retainer, with, which is a sort of bodyguard or attendant. Because that's just how they move on in Japan. They're a wild kind. There were a couple more attempts taken at stealing his sword, but for the most part, Benkei was very loyal and focused on his job. Eventually, during the Battle of Horomogawa, Benkei would solidify his legacy forever. At this battle, Minamono no Yoshitsune committed seppuku before the much more numerically advanced Taira warriors forced their way in. To buy time for his lord to kill himself, Benkei stood on the bridge leading to the castle, ready to give his life for the honor of his lord. When the enemy forces approached, he stood there menacingly. With him being such a large man, for Japan, he had quite an imposing aura on a battlefield, especially when standing alone on a bridge outside of a castle. Especially, especially considering what Sohei usually wore and carried into battle, just in my opinion, is more terrifying than standard samurai battle dress. I'll, uh, I'll throw up some images on screen. Regardless, the infantry charged and they were massacred with ease thanks to Benkei's massive Naginata. Wave after wave of infantry came to the bridge only to meet their end. The enemy troops began calling him the Onikawa, but they continued their assault as they had no choice. Eventually, as Benkei grew tired, the infantry got more and more hits in, and according to the legend, there were many spears and swords protruding from the Onikawa, but still he stood ready for more. Eventually, the commander of the enemy army decided to stop sending men to their deaths, and instead rained arrows upon the local Sohei. Benkei was hit so many times by arrows and spears that when he died, his body remained propped up. Now utterly terrified, the army waited for some time before attacking again, because from what they could tell, this so-called Onikawa was still alive and ready to fight. It took them a few hours before one man approached the corpse and saw he was dead, proclaiming that his soul had moved on, but his body had remained steadfast and dutiful. All right now, you have to imagine, just, just think with me, how horrifying this would be. You know, you can barely read. And for all you know, that is very well a demon at the delivering end of that spear, standing there alone, hacking down scores of men. Now, obviously it's probably somewhat dramatized, but it's still very cool. It's a very uh, intriguing story. Now, back to actual history. The Sengoku Jidai era saw the end of the Sohei influence, but they certainly went out swinging. Because a lot of the conflicts during the Sengoku Jidai were centered around Kyoto, the Sohei were kind of forced to join in. This time, however, they did not pick sides and instead fought for themselves. That's not to say a lot of Sohei did not become mercenaries, because they most certainly did. During this conflict, we also see the beginnings of a new kind of Sohei, most commonly called the Ikoiki. These guys were situated farther north than most other Sohei and followed the Jodo Shinsu sect, as opposed to the main Tendai faith of their counterparts. They are famed for being even more devoted to their faith, to a point of near fanatical belief. The Ikoiki began as a revolution directly against the samurai as a whole, and they opposed the shogunate and spread like wildfire, right? It was all over the place, because from what I can gather, they kind of promised equality for all. You know, a different, a different view than the uh, social caste system that was really rigid at the time. They took over Kaga province and quickly spread to other lands, even defeating Tokugawa Ieyasu and encountering Oda Nobunaga. To nobody's, to nobody's surprise, that ended pretty bad for them. Now, the Sohei met their end on September 29th, 1571. This is roughly speaking, by the way. When Oda Nobunaga besieged the Enryakuji, massacring a massive, massive amount of Buddhist men, women, and children. From then on, the Sohei never really regained their power, and after a few more small battles with Ieyasu and the new shogunate, they were put down forever, unfortunately. Now, that's all for today. Hopefully you enjoyed and learned some cool stuff about the Sohei. Join me next week where we'll talk about the Onnabu Geisha, the female samurai of Japan. Mitakudete, arigatou gozaimasu.